So the World Federation of the Deaf was established in 1951. So it's a bit old. It is one of the oldest disability organizations in the world that we're aware of. And you know there are many national organizations in various countries for disabled rights. But who do you think is the oldest? Well, it just happens to be the World Federation of the Deaf. So we should be very proud that we've been working together to support the rights of deaf people for such a long time. This is the current board of the World Federation of the Deaf, and everyone on the board is a deaf person themselves. We had hearing delegates, and that continued for about 40 years, but we made the decision to have an entirely deaf board. We are a global organization. The board is voted on. They have a four-year term. We typically have a convention prior to the election. The new board is given a mandate for the following uh, four-year term, and that's what they work on then. In 1999, a few individuals came together to increase their networking and to work on different fields related to the life and experience of deaf people. Now, who is an expert on the history of the World Federation of the Deaf? And that's Dr. Peter Hauser. He's been wonderful. He's been working with the WFD for a number of years now. He's also been working as a volunteer, and he's got a lot of talent, and he's been really supporting the World Federation of the Deaf. Great support for us. We have a number of ad hoc groups that focus on different issues. For example, women's issues. There's a lot of areas they work on. There's also an ad hoc group for gay and lesbian issues. That seems to be quite strong. We have an ad hoc group for deaf-blind individuals and seniors. The goal of these organizations, again, is a four-year mandate that they work on to support these various stakeholder groups. Now, the executive is represented by different nations across the world, of course, and they are elected. America was one of the representatives as well. And there was a president from the World Federation of the Deaf here. And that individual has now joined the board. And now Dr. Joe Murphy is on the board for the World Federation of the Deaf. Prior to that, Yurker Anderson was the president of the World Federation of the Deaf, and I had a chance to work with him for many wonderful years. Now, as I mentioned, the World Federation of the Deaf is a global organization, and it's impossible to tell you everyone that's involved, but we have many large regions and various secretariats for those regions. Those individuals are given autonomy to decide who acts on the board or who represents them, and they have their own source of funding as well. We have nine major uh, secretariats, as you can see here. The European Secretariat has been the most successful. Also, the Asian Pacific has been quite active as well. Some other secretariats have done well, but these two in particular have been the most active and the most important countries in the World Federation of the Deaf. And of course, the United Nations has asked us who is involved, so we've sent out various surveys and questionnaires, and that's helped us collect data on the membership of the World Federation of the Deaf.
Now, the World Federation of the Deaf is well-renowned, but I'd like to go back and tell you a little bit about my history with the organization. When I joined, there are various individuals, of course, involved, but no one on the board used a sign language, if you can imagine. I started on the board in 1983, and at that point I had written a mandate to follow for the next four years that was given to me when I was elected. And of course all the board members are voted in, and there are people from the various countries, the Scandinavian countries for example, and I was voted in to represent Finland. And for me I felt there was one key thing that had to be included in our mandate or action plan, and that was the use of a sign language. So I was a little bit nervous, but I approached the board and I talked to various members and I got some resistance. Some said, we can't have a sign language, an official language. We should have a spoken language, much more recognized and important. Now you have to remember that sign languages have been established in many countries for decades and were quite vibrant, but the oralist movement had a serious impact on people's attitude about the use of sign languages. And there were many deaf leaders who were doing great work, but they were concerned if we did use a sign language instead of one of the oral languages. There was still that attitude that if a couple had a deaf child, that was reason for grieving or sorrow, and we weren't celebrating the birth of deaf children or the use of a sign language. And this wasn't that long ago. This was 1983. So this was in our, you know, fairly recent past. So I remember at one meeting, I said, please, can we put sign language as one of our mandate? And I got the response, oh, why not total communication? We have that here already. And the world wasn't quite ready for a sign language. And I said, but they are unaware that we do have this is native sign languages. And there was a lot of debate about this. And I felt like I was about to be <laughs> shot by some of the leaders at the World Federation of the Deaf. But I persevered and I pleaded with them. I said, please. And there was one individual who supported me and said, well, we can put total communication and sign language. And that was Jurker Anderson, for which I'm very grateful. At that point, you know, he was the president of the World Federation of the Deaf. So it was included in our mandate. And I can say that after 20 years, the World Federation of the Deaf made a fairly quick conversion to the use of a sign language. And I have to thank the board members who were involved because they helped the organization this is from Scandinavia, from various countries. And finally, countries were recognized as sign languages, uh, legitimate languages. They were starting to use that to educate deaf children in schools. Board members were coming to the World Federation of the Deaf, who, unlike the older board members, were ashamed to be using a sign language in public. New board members are much more open to the idea. And so it's been 20 years, and you can see how beautiful and effective it's been using a sign language for the World Federation of the Deaf. So I have to thank those individuals. At the same time, we have to also understand that across the globe, there is very little recognition for sign languages legally, or a very official recognition. I'd say there was 40 countries that even considered the recognitions but you see today, there are so many countries that have recognized indigenous sign languages. And we have to thank the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I think, for that recognition. The meaning of this slide is that the World Federation of the Deaf is there to promote sign languages, but also promote association with the United Nations and to work globally with different deaf communities. And I think that has been an effective goal, and we've been quite successful in that mandate. So worldwide, there's a large population, and the World Federation of the Deaf is there to work with them in an alliance. Many of them live in developing countries, and we estimate 80%. The rest, for example, in Africa, South America, and Asia. Now, when we start looking at how many have access to education, I began my work in the WFD 
We sent out a number of surveys. And at that point, we found out that about 20% had no education. But then the number was even lower in some of these developing countries. And I'm wondering, you know, what was wrong with our research methods or our numbers? And you have to remember, 20 years ago, there was a strong emphasis on mainstreaming. And in the developing countries, many of the schools were being closed. So a child would be mainstreamed and have no access to this information or deaf peers. They would then be sent home. They wouldn't be kept in school. So you can see why the low numbers for education. Some had never attended school, and over 80% we found had never stepped into an educational institution, which is a serious and significant problem from WFD's perspective. So the World Federation of the Deaf has, of course, advocated for the language rights and promotion of Indigenous signed languages. And, of course, different countries have their own native sign languages. In some cases, they have two or three different languages. In Finland, we have two, two sign languages. There's Finnish sign language and Finnish-Swedish sign language. People have moved to live in Finland or Sweden, and the languages have evolved over time. So we have the two distinct languages. And I know in China, for example, in the East, there's a lot of variety in those sign languages, much like in the West. In India, it's a very large country, and of course, due to the geography, there are several different signed languages that are indigenous. People often ask, how many sign languages are there in the world? And it's been estimated maybe 300 or slightly above. So 6,000 at least spoken languages that have been recognized. But there are only approximately 1,000 spoken languages that have a written form and 5,000 don't. So many spoken languages aren't written. And many languages around the world are oppressed perhaps due to that. And it's interesting, if you look at the world today, you know, there's much conflict occurring. And it's not always between countries. It's sometimes civil war, civil strife, individuals looking for their rights. For example, in Kosovo and, and different areas like Russian areas. And yet people still maintain their individual languages, even when they are oppressed. If we look at Yugoslavia, for example, there's a number of different languages and cultures in one country. It's very difficult but that these countries maintain their independence and their different cultures and languages. But it means, though, we need recognition for these languages and for these rights. And the United Nations have been trying to promote language and linguistic rights. We have become a member of the United Nations, and they've given us tools to work with for the recognition of sign languages. So language rights, but also linguistic rights, and what we call linguistic human rights. So you can't just look at the language itself. You have to look at the users of the language. And we need legally binding legislation that will maintain these rights. We have organizations like UNESCO, and the purpose of UNESCO, and I will show you that in my next slide, this is a symbol of what other countries have. They have international legal standards on language rights. They have constitution. So there's a lot of information and tools from UNESCO. So we look at linguistic rights, human rights. For us, the key is language rights for individuals.
and not just language rights, but also legally binding language rights, also human rights. And this is a symbol of what we're working for today, where we disseminate this information and you understand more about your language rights. And I'm trying to sign in your language to recognize your rights. And it's not just a matter of legality. It is your basic human rights to have a language. So I know you all recognize the importance of language. And many people say, you know, my language is part of my identity. It's related to who I am. So a sign language is part of me. And it's how I identify as a deaf person, as a deaf community, how I choose to associate with others. Whereas others would look at sign language and not value it. They would believe that that is disability. And we've seen this. It's a very sensitive issue as well. And I'll tell you my experience, what I've seen in the world, and perhaps you've had the same experience, but it's a very serious issue. And that is the status of sign languages and to have them recognized on par. We have majority and minority language groups, but again, the importance is maintaining equality and not allowing one to overtake the other. I believe my language has been oppressed. And that's, I think, why we need our rights recognized. So we do need to act to make sure that happens. In Finland, where schools have been established, for example, by a deaf person, and in a few years, the students do well, they're able to write and finish. They can do poetry, uh, their education is excellent, and there might not be any spoken Finnish practice there. And that happened historically. And then in the times of the oral education, it was quite a change. A student would take 10 years in school, where it would have taken them three years in a bilingual or a signing school to learn the same amount of information. And that's part of our history. We have to be aware of majority languages, society, our own language. We have to be aware of what's happening in other countries. I know there's a lot happening in America, but I have to know about Finland and the status of different languages. And we can use that information to then support each other. And this is you know, how we promote what's going on. We talk about languages and language rights in other countries to promote our own. We have to take action, and the World Federation of the Deaf is one of those organizations, and we hope that NAD looks at what the World Federation has done and promotes the same goals and the same mission. We also need people in positions of management, and we need various strategies and action plans, and by following those, and doing it systematically, step by step. I think, you know, we can win. We can be successful. That's my experience. In Finland, we had a vision. We wanted sign language to be recognized, and we worked towards that, and we were successful. Now we have another vision, and we've been working on that. And I think it's always important, wherever you go, uh, whatever steps or path you follow, you should have some vision. Networking is an essential tool. There are various national deaf agencies, and you have to establish goals and missions. You have to have people working towards organizations. You need universities and academic institutions to work together. You need governmental support, and you need people to promote the language together. In addition, we have to look at the work of the United Nations and what they've done for language rights and affiliate with organizations like that. So who's going to carry on that work and the negotiations and the discussions? 
We need things like the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities. You need to be aware of what's in that convention, and it is a primary tool for us. It recognizes the international human rights of individuals, and it is documented, and it recognizes the right to a sign language. Now you have to realize the United Nations has various conventions. They look at disabled groups. They have conventions for different language groups, the French, the English. And this is the first one that they have documented the rights for sign language users. So I am just thrilled. And I think we should be happy as the deaf community because of that tool. You also need to look at what your various deaf community needs, and we need tools. We need symbols to work with. I've mentioned a few. Article 21 in the CPRD promotes the use of sign languages, but how do we promote that? One means is doing more research. Another is education and training. We need media support to show the use of sign language. We need interpreters. We need to educate parents of the value of sign language, so it must be promoted. We need to establish programs, and we need to do that to maintain our rights. So these are good tools that we have to be aware of. So an important tool is the convention, the CRPD. It's an excellent tool to use, but there are so many others as well. Getting the information out there, there's recommendations. For example, they recognize that the world is multilingual. And they have a sign language documented finally, so we can use that as a tool. We have to look at how others have created programs and how they've used those tools, and we have to make use of those tools for the disabled and use the convention, but other tools as well. So the World Federation of the Deaf has been working on gathering those tools, and we've documented some of these, and we've just announced some of that. So we've looked at what other countries and organizations have, and there has to be, for example, equal rights to opportunities, and that's part of the declaration. There's one document, an international document, that looks at language and culture groups. And it recognizes those language and cultural groups at the United Nations level. There is the CRPD, the Convention on the Disabled, so we have those two documents. And many deaf individuals say, oh, I'm not disabled, why would I even pay attention to this? I'm only a language and culture group. And I said, that's fine, yes. This is true. And I think that's a good attitude to have a good philosophy. But if you look at the convention more deeply, you'll see how useful it is. It represents new thoughts, new thinking across the world, one being in equality of the various members of the global community. So yes, there are different cultures, and yes, there are different groups, but at the same time, we are all equal Uh, under the law. There are different ways to go about the work in fighting for the rights that we have attained through the convention. This is a slide showing you the different access routes. One of them is through civil and political rights. You can also see that it's important that we take each basic step to build these conventions. There was no rights for those with disabilities, but we were able to tap into these different places and these different established declarations. WFD is now participating far more in the conventions. We have a different conventions for different people. For example, there are those with disabilities, those who are fighting for women's rights, and we are giving lots of input to those groups, especially focusing on those with disabilities. 
WFD is trying to educate the nations and our partners on how to give their feedback and input, working towards promoting rights for those who are disabled. Oftentimes, in working with the UN, they were unaware of some of these programs, so we were able to bring this to the UN. One of the current problems today that we are facing is in the realm of education. With all the mainstream programs, it's difficult for students' rights to be acquired. A big question now that WFD is working on is how can we work on education? For those who are mainstreamed in very rural settings who may have only one or two deaf students within their school, how do they discover their deaf identity? How do they learn who they are? And how do they learn what their rights are as a deaf person? Where does their fluency in sign language come from without role models? So these are programs we're hoping to establish in the future. I think it's important to look at the base and build from the base of what we have. If you look at this, this is an important comment to make. I think communication is necessary for everyone in all their environments, whether it be education in the classroom, whether it be during times of activity and play. I think access to communication needs to be there continually for all of our deaf children. As we said before, only 17% of deaf children are able to receive an education. We need to grow those numbers. Tomorrow's world is being built today, and that's being done through human rights, through signed languages, and through your rights. All of us need to use these tools and work together in conjunction. We need to network with each other to build these programs. Signed languages is your language right. Everyone has a right to their own language. Never forget that. Keep that close to you and be active in trying to promote this throughout the world. Thank you very much.